Okay. We are live now. Can you see mm. my screen? Mm, not yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to toggle it around here to see if I'm the one to kind of make it possible for you to share. I don't know. Okay. This must be something. And it's showing display that you are sharing in your in your end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I can see it now. Yes, you can see it. Yes, I can see it. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah, and now it's it's kind of gone because it's it showed like a, like like. What about now? Uh, I still can see it because what I about now? I, I, no, you can see it. Because what happened, yeah, what happened was you appeared as okay. two accounts and I added the account with the presentation and appeared. Then I was able to see your, your, your slides. Okay. So let me share again. Yeah. Can you see now? Yes. Yeah, now I can see it. Thank okay. hmm. you. So, hello. Good evening, everyone. Joining us live on our monthly on the BioRTC Biomedical Research and Training Center webinar series, which is taking place monthly. Uh, and in this episode, we host Dr. Yunus Muhammad Garba to discuss his work on mosquitoes. So, Dr. Yunusa, <clears throat> at the moment is a postdoctoral is a postdoc researcher uh, working with Assistant Professor Benjamin Matthews at the University at the British University um, Columbia in Canada. Dr. Garba is a leader and community builder in Training Africa, which is and training is a UK-based organization dedicated to developing research capacity and training in natural sciences across Africa. He co-organizes yearly neuroscience course dedicated to helping African researchers. And he also is a staff member at the university, uh, at Gombe State University in Nigeria. So Dr. Gerba is among the few resource people we are having in Nigeria that were able to lay their hands on the training and are still getting training um, in the global, the global world. And they were able to make their arms rich to see how they will impact the research and scientists in Africa specifically in Nigeria. And this is one of the aims of establishing biomedical research and training center to see we have a state of art laboratory or a center which will make it possible for people to visit and be able to carry out research and be able to get mentorship. 
So we're really happy to have Dr. Yunusa today as one of our mentors in BioRTC. And that will also discuss, he will be discussing about on the topic of olicidotin, the repertoire of chemosensory receptors involved in the oviposition behavior of Aedes aegypti mosquito. And uh, without taking much of the time, I would like to um, give the floor to Dr. Yunusa to carry us to, the, uh, to his, uh, his work. Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. OK. Uh, Zaid, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. OK. Yeah, so hello, everyone. And uh, thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I would like to thank specifically the um, organizers of this uh, webinar. And uh, I would like to um, also thank the um, the funders of this uh, uh, BioRTC center in uh, UOB, Nigeria. And also uh, the audience, and uh, I would like to indulge you and uh, thank you for even tuning in to listen to me talk. So um, without taking much of your time, I would like to um, go through what I've been doing for the past one and a half years uh, in Canada. So like the uh, UPID says, I'm a, a Human Frontier of Science, um, long-term fellow, and uh, Matthew Smith Foundation for uh, Research uh, Training so from the University of British Columbia, and also a proud from the State University lecturer. So thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about the elucidating the repertoire of uh, chemical receptors involved in opposition behavior of Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. So when we talk about um, the repertoire of these uh, receptors involved in opposition, of, of opposition we, uh, first of all, let me give you um, an overview or an introduction as um, uh, to this Aedes aegypti. So Aedes aegypti are deadly vectors of uh, adoviral pathogens. They transmit viruses that can cause diseases like yellow fever, Zika, and dengue. And the only female mosquitoes uh, feed on blood so they can obtain the nutrients they need to develop their eggs. So they lay their eggs in carefully selected areas uh, or sites that is not harmful to their uh, offspring. And this is the are uh, extremely adaptable. So I will show you why they are extremely ad adaptable. The reason is they are found breeding a wide variety of urban and rural aquatic sites associated with human habitation. And also, they kind of um, go to all these intricate places where you left um, uh, discarded plastic or any uh, uh, container that can contain water, anything that can contain water for, um, for more than a week, they can thrive there and can be able to lay their eggs and also kind of uh, emerge as adults and further uh, transmitting these viruses across uh, the populace. They may likely require physiological and behavioral adaptability to drive in these areas, so that they need to adapt to the situation because not, not all the cases where they are found that the water that they kind of um, lay their eggs um, is the same. So um, what we are looking for, what we're trying to understand is how do they kind of um, uh, lay these eggs in different constituents? How do they know that this water is uh, different or is okay for them to to uh, to lay their eggs since they know they kind of uh, try to understand that these waters or these uh, constituents are not harmful to their uh, offspring before they lay their, the eggs. And ADC they, they kind of look at these uh, cues from these waters and uh, substrates to make sure that, okay, this place is okay for me to lay my eggs. And uh, so this is, as you can see, this the green uh, area here is the um, uh, the fundamental niche for the Aedes aegypti. And uh, the gray background is where it is unsuitable for them to, to leave. But as you can see that this green is becoming like, you know, uh, is kind of um, going up uh, to areas or areas where uh, you don't find them. So now they are adapted to this new environment. And this is what we are trying to understand. How do they adapt to this environment? How, what are the receptors within these uh, body parts of these mosquitoes that test this environment and make 
like you know acquainted with this environment and for them to thrive. So our main question uh, of the study is we aim to understand how these ADC dipteria mosquitoes explore and become accustomed to different origination sites in order to lay their eggs. So we break it down into specific objectives. So it's to establish first is to establish wild caught uh, colony from distinctly different ovipositional sites, and also to determine the level of specialization to these distinct ovipositional site water constituents, and also to quantify the behavior of wild caught ages and their laboratory conspecific before, during, and after egg laying behavior. So first of all, for us to achieve that, we went to uh, the northeast of Nigeria in Gombe. We went to four different sites with distinctly different types of breeding sites where we collected these uh, uh, ages. So as you can see that we collected from um, uh, construction Which areas. Different types of breeding. As you can see that we collected from. Uh, so we collected from uh, gardens. We collected from uh, you see from homes and also from rock holes, and then we quantify the constituents. Uh, within these environments, like you know, present in these uh, waters, and we found that there are these mosquitoes there. So, for us to confirm that these mosquitoes are the same, we need to uh, indulge in, like you know, understanding what um, distinguish them or what uh, what species are they. Before we reach that path. I would like to check you and show you, like you know, the life cycle of this ADC, uh, ADC mosquito. Um, the ADC, ADC mosquito start from, let's say, the, the chicken and the egg uh, issue, but let's start from the from where the uh, the female mosquito bites the person and takes in blood, and this blood helps in female uh, egg production. And uh, after this um, blood feeding, the mosquito moves around find a suitable place to uh, lay her egg. So it finds a, where, uh, um, a place where there is the water with a receding shoreline, for example, where the substrate is. So that place is a bit um, uh, dampened. So the mosquito touches this place and then goes into the water and then uh, uh, and lay the eggs on the substrate. And also this, uh, as the water increases, it's like, you know, engulfs the eggs and then the eggs hatch and then becomes, um, the eggs hatch to become this uh, lava, the first lava stage, and then it goes through the stages uh, to the um, lava stage, and then emerge as um, the pupa. From the pupa, it emerges to the adult. And then from the adult, they meet again, and they find human, and they bite, and the cycle continues. So that's how, that's why it's very important to clear all this water from all these uh, containers around your uh, environment. So, and also for us in the lab, for us to mimic that human uh, nature or the, uh, for us to supply the, uh, the insects with the blood that they need for, for um, digestion or for um, like, you know, production of the eggs, we need to mimic the human uh, nature. One is we have to bring the temperature of, the, of our feeders to around uh, the same temperature as humans and also uh, increase humidity um, blow in some of, uh, CO2 within the, uh, the chamber and um, allow these gravid mosquitoes for them to be able to, like, you know, find this um, uh, blood feeders and then feed on them so, so that we can be able to collect the eggs, so, so that we can, be, we can do our further experiments with them. As you can see, the mosquitoes are there, like, you know, taking the blood. So, first of all, from the samples we collected, we need to uh, identify this uh, wild caught species to know exactly what we are looking at. And for you to do that, we need to look at uh, the morphological and do also a DNA barcoding. So, for the morphological, you know, um, we have a, a species of Aedes aegypti, and then we have the subspecies of this Aedes aegypti. And uh, the subspecies is Aedes aegypti formosus. And and Aegypti Aegypti. Egypt. So these are the uh, mosquitoes. These are the main vectors of uh, this viral pathogen. Uh, like I said earlier, uh, Zika, Dengue, and Yellow Fever. And uh, you can see that there are a bit uh, clear uh, differences in, in terms of uh, coloration of their uh, body. 
And uh, when you go down deep into the, um, looking at the targets or the stripes within the back or the abdomen of the, of the mosquito, you will see that the like, you know, kind of clear differences, pale scales which is in Aegypti Aegypti, here in Aegypti, 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 but it's absent in Aegypti, Aegypti Formosis. So for you to confirm this after like, you know, looking at the morphological part, then you need to go into um, uh, the DNA sequencing. One of the things that you need to do is you need to, um, one, there are two methods. So one of the methods is cytochrome oxidase subunit, um, uh, which is part of the mitochondrial DNA. Um, so you take this particular gene and then you, you, you kind of blast it against the, uh, the genetic code of the whole um, uh, uh, species so that you can see whether there is a, a match. So if there is a match, you know that you have a ADC gene. So first of all, mm -hmm. and then the second one is the internet transcribed spacer, ITS2, which is uh, part of the nuclear ribosomal DNA. So um, that you do the same thing as the one you do in the, you did in the CO1. And uh, here you can see that we did uh, the PCR and uh, the, the all aligned to uh, here is the CO1 and all the species aligned to the CO1. And uh, here is the uh, ITS2 and uh, all the species aligned to ITS2. So what we further uh, try to understand is to send for sequencing. And then we sent for sequencing and then the sequencing results came back. We have 99% uh, um, uh, comparison or uh, uh, and then we have uh, in the whole, in three species, but in the one of the species, it's only 60%. When we look at it, it shows that it is not Aegis aegypti, Aegis pitatus, but they have all the characteristics of Aegis aegypti. But this one too is the, the same, is um, also um, a vector of uh, upgrade of pathogen, but it's, known the main, it's not the main vector of uh, the transmission of this disease. So one, uh, since we understand what type of mosquitoes they are or the, uh, the uh, species, so what we try to understand now is to determine the level of specialization to this distinct opposition site water constraint. Since we collected them from different sites, so we need to put them in a, uh, we put one mosquito in a situation whereby they are, uh, is exposed to four different sites and see whether they can be able to, uh, to, uh, um, respond or be kind of um, attracted to uh, other sites or it's only attracted to, to, to its own site so that we can understand the generalization or specialization of this uh, mosquito. So for a mosquito to, to reach a gravid site, there are some conditions that need to be met uh, for, this, uh, for her to decide uh, where to lay her egg. First of all, she needs to do a lot of uh, uh, understanding or probing of the of long range cues. Long range cues are uh, one visual, olfactory, and thermal or humidity sensors to track these long range cues. Uh, for the visual, she needs to know, like, okay, there is the body of water there. And also for olfaction, you know, um, odorants are carried by convection through air uh, to the, um, for, for the insect to, like, you know, uh, to get in contact with. So they follow this uh, odor gradient to where this opposition site is. And also, when they reach this opposition site or this water body sites, they kind of have to prove the environment. Is the environment solely water only? There is no shoreline, or is the environment the temperature? Is the temperature okay? Is the salinity okay? Is the pH okay? Is the are there presence of tox uh, toxic parasites? No. Are there presence of uh, semi-chemicals from other conspecifics? Yes or no. So they understand this before they lay their eggs. So that's um, uh, some tricky part of how these mosquitoes do. So it's they are very like you know intelligent in in in, in that sense I, I can say, but but for them to probe this, they need those receptors from their appendages that get in contact with this uh, opposition site to actually know uh, that uh, they are in the right space at the right time. So for us to understand this, to quantify or to understand these events that happen during this um, uh, uh, overposition uh, behavior. So we kind of um, use a modified octopi, which is, uh, uh, which is a flexible setup for monitoring small animals. And uh, this is like an open source uh, um, uh, design that we adopted 
and then we uh, we created us in the lab and um, so so we put the mosquitoes like I said we exposed them to four different sites uh, water and then we allowed the mosquito to choose this site for to lay the eggs so and then we quantify the movement around this area you can see on this side at site B the mosquito mostly spends her time within in that space because maybe it's more suitable for her to to thrive. And this is to gain insight into the extent of this general specialization in opposition site selection for this um, uh, mosquito. So for us in the future, what we want to do is to quantify at what level does the mosquito uh, make that decision? How does the probe, probing, the graded probing happen within those sites? How does she like, you know, move from here to here to here and, and, and be able to know that, okay, okay, this is, uh, and, and kept the memory of where she was before. Like, okay, the, the other side is better, or this side is better than the other side. You know, that kind of um, uh, uh, higher, um, higher uh, decision-making process that happens within um, that space. And also we wanted to understand this egg laying process. What are the series of sensory events that are called before, during, and after egg laying? Like I said, that they need to probe that area. So for us to understand the probing, the, 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 the understanding of that particular area. So we need to quantify in, in, in that sense, how does it happen? So for us to do that, we put this mosquito in, a, in an area whereby we, we allow her to, to, to be able to have like, you know, this water line with the shoreline and, and the mosquito. And another thing is we, we track the, the whole body parts. Uh, we use a deep learning algorithm which is uh, like uh, I would say for uh, other people, it's uh, uh, using artificial intelligence to tag each and every part of this body part. And when we tag the, each and every part of this body part, we can be able to monitor the Cartesian coordinates of each and every limb or each and every body part. So that we can be able to understand when does this mosquito put its leg into the water and understand that, okay, this is water and I, this water is safe for me to lay my egg um, around here. And so we want to quantify those uh, decision-making process or those events that happens during that um, uh, egg laying process. So, and then the next uh, is to show you that during that, after all these events, the mosquito lay the egg. So what happens before egg laying and what happens after egg laying? So that we can be able to tag and understand that this uh, particular body part is the most used before egg laying or is the most used after egg laying so that we can be able to understand that receptor uh, level uh, differences. And also, uh, we, as I show you in, in, a, in a bigger picture, so we zoomed in to understand in, in, in the mechanistic uh, parts of uh, this um, probing of that water. For example, you see that this mosquito is keeping its leg into the water and out. And uh, we want to see the interaction of the opipositor, where the egg comes from. That's the lower abdominal segment. And also the distance gauging with the leg. So for example, now you see that the mosquito uh, put its leg into the water and then it's the kind of, they lay their egg within the shoreline, not inside the water, but you see them on the, on the like, you know, the shoreline of the, of the water. So how do they gauge that distance? So that's what we are trying to understand in that uh, sense. So for us to do that, we have to um, create and recreate different setups and different types of um, uh, tools for us to like, you know, be able to, to quantify this behavior. So one of the tools that we, we created now uh, based on that is for us to be able to have uh, a top and the side view of the mosquito so that we can be able to see what is happening when they put their um, ovipositor, you see this is the ovipositor, she's dragging it along the way and then she lays the egg. You see um, as the mosquito is moving. So you see she lays egg, one egg immediately after putting the ovipositor into the water and then she's now coming back. Um, so this is what happens. This is the process. So we want to look at the high resolution process of how this is going on, you know, and then you know, the last time um, uh, uh, some people in our lab or my supervisor looked at, he looked at the, the process by understanding that there is a, a like, you know, a, 
some interesting genes that are responsible or receptors that are responsible for detecting water. But we want to understand that, okay, apart from water in other constituents, like I showed you from different sites, there are uh, different types of constituents that are responsible that the mosquito check. So further down the, uh, the presentation, I will show you. And uh, as you can see, the mosquito goes back into the water, back again, like, you know, goes off uh, and then lay more eggs within the environment. You see, it touches and then goes back and it lays some eggs and this eggs, some of the eggs receded into the water. So another thing is to quantify the amount of time the mosquito gets its legs into the water. How many times we quantify that within the frame? For example, this is a 10 minute video and uh, you can see that the mosquito put its leg into the water, how many times that, that, that quantification. And also you see, this is uh, some of the body, like, you know, this is the left hind limb and this is the right hind limb. This is the uh, lower abdominal segment. This is where mm -hmm. the, um, the, the eggs come from. So it puts the, uh, the, uh, the, the ovipositio into the water and back. Uh, then uh, go, goes out again. So you can see that there are, there are in, it's intermittent in terms of uh, the time they, they, they dip their, the, the, the body parts into the water. And then we can be able to say, like I said, we, we, we try to know at what frame or at what time does this mosquito, what was the gesture that it does before, like, you know, uh, laying the egg. So you can be able to understand. Um, so I think we are having some technical issue with our presenter. There's a little bit of problem with uh, probably the network. So, uh, and also, so be able to quantify it in terms of how many times uh, these uh, body parts touch the water. Hello, do you bear with us, please, as we try to restore the network. 
of our presenter. I think he's having some technical um, problem. <clears throat> Before we are able to restore our presenter, let's um, let a bit discuss about the upcoming event in BioRTC. So as we know, Biomedical Research and Training Center is a center established purposely to provide a state-of-art equipment, um, make the environment what is like in, in Africa, which is a standard laboratory or standard research center capable of giving providing um, of, of housing the necessary equipment required to do modern science but then apart from that the most important thing in science usually is not usually the equipment but the mentality of the scientists and the ability of us dedication of scientists into research ability to ask questions and the ability to, to look for for mentorship, ability to kind of answer questions that are really troubling the society. Uh, <clears throat> just a moment. So we are, our, our presenter is back online. Sorry, do bear with us with a little bit of the network glitch. We'll since, continue. Since when? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think uh, <laughs> some minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Some uh, minutes. Yes, yeah, some minutes ago. Yeah, where? Not this exactly. yes, particularly this the one? slide before. Yes, yes, this slide, particular slide. Yeah, this one. This one? The last movement, yes. Okay. Where you have the last okay. movement. Okay, like this? Yeah, we have done that. I've heard this Yeah, with, I think, two slides. Okay, this. so. Yeah. Okay, yeah. This movement, yeah. right? Last yeah, movement. Yeah, yeah, yeah right? last movement, yes. I think we still can't hear you very well. I don't know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, okay, so yeah. thank you. <laughs> Sorry for that. I didn't realize. Uh... Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay. 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 So this low abdominal segment it's uh can you hear me yes okay okay just leave your mic on so that i can be able to see, hear the feedback uh from okay you. okay uh -huh. so yeah so the lower abdominal segment uh like i said we tracked the uh cortex in this uh, uh coordinates and so we can be able to track uh, this and show the, the movement within over time and space and be able to know what happened before uh, egg lane and also after egg lane. So, and we can also quantify the amount of time. You see, this is um, uh, the, the two legs uh, behind, uh, two hint legs. And also this is the uh, lower abdominal segment where it was interacting. Uh, 
uh, with the water. So you can see that uh, more times uh, the legs went into the water than the lower abdominal segment. That's where the, the X comes from. So to understand that, so we need to further probe into understanding those particular receptors that are important in detecting what is where, you know. Uh, so for example, here, we I marked uh, some places and, and, and put, um, like, you know, for example, these are the tarsi, this is the lower abdominal segment, and this is the proboscis. And um, within that, there are embedded uh, receptors that when you, when the mosquito put the, uh, one of these uh, appendage into the water, can be able to sense the constituents. And these constituents are enormous. Like I showed you, we collected these uh, mosquitoes from different sites, and all these uh, sites have a distinct characteristic consequence. And for the mosquito to be able to quantify and say, okay, this is okay for me to lay my eggs, um, I think uh, it's worth like, you know, understanding the repertoire of this uh, uh, receptors that are uh, embedded within there. The response of these receptors or the less of the importance of even the appendages dipping into the water. Um, this work was done by my supervisor. Uh, showed, they showed that when you allow the mosquito access to water, to touch the water, they can be able to lay their eggs within the shoreline. But when you put a mesh and block the mosquito from accessing the water, even if the substrate or the entire space is damp, but cannot be able to touch this water, they will receive their egg and then they will not like, you know, uh, 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 lay the eggs within that space. So, and then this was quantified, as you can see, free access to water, uh, the eggs were laid over a thousand eggs by 10 mosquitoes, 10 females. And also this is uh, uh, the ones that were not uh, allowed to touch the water. There was, uh, they didn't lay their, their eggs. So that means they understand that if I touch the water and I feel the water is there, then I can lay my eggs within the shoreline and eventually my offspring will thrive afterwards. So that's an intelligent um, uh, kind of uh, decision-making process for them to, 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 to try in, in, uh, in the environment. So for us to understand what type of receptors are there, so there is a, like uh, my supervisor in his former lab worked on, on this, using CRISPR-Cas uh, modification, this CRISPR-Cas9 uh, genetic uh, knock-in. Uh, strategy to build a genetic tool for leveling and imaging this uh, molecularly defined uh, populations of neurons and generated a reporter line expressing this key of two transcriptional activator from the indigenous um, PPK301. So this is, um, so they have a tool whereby they map the cells that are carrying this PPK301. This PPK301 is within the sensory cells, uh, sensory neurons within the, um, the body. And they mark them so that they can be able to see them. So using this uh, uh, genetic modi modification. As you can see, this is the proboscis, uh, the presence of this uh, PPK301 uh, cells. And also this is the tarsi, this is the leg. So where you can see that there is the presence of this PPK301 cells. And uh, for them, uh, so, so they found out that these sensory neurons expressing this PPK301 control, control egg laying initiation and choice in ADC gifting. So I will show you um, some of the work that they have done. And uh, so for the mosquito to understand there is a space or the water is okay, so they need to first understand there, is a, there should be a receptor for understanding there is a water. And also there should be a receptor for understanding then there is like a parasite or um, um, any other chemicals that is harmful or that is like, you know, okay, or that is the presence of other conspecific larvae and all that, so that they can be able to gauge and understand that, okay, this place is okay for me to lay my eggs and, or, or, or not. So this PPK301 is expressed in sensory neurons in legs and proboscis and appendages that directly contact water. And that sensory afferents from these PPK301 expressed in neurons projected the central Test centers. 
So to probe or to quantify the response of these uh, neurons that carry this gene PPK301, uh, that should be need for like, you know, um, uh, in vivo calcium imaging. So with this genetically encoded uh, sensor GCAMP, uh, uh, GCAMP6, so for, it, for them to, to glow while they are stimulated. This um, uh, is put into water. Um, <clears throat> I think we're still having a little problem with the nitro. We apologize for the inconveniences and the network glitch. So that, that is um, like you know a, a, a stimulation of water or anything a stimulant at uh, like you know when the water is just uh, like you know pure water uh, and then or fresh water and then when you increase the level of like you know salt concentration. So <clears throat> I think the network glitch is persisting and uh, we are temporarily not in touch with our presenter at the moment. Yeah. Okay. No. okay. Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, let me share my screen. Okay. In, sorry, it's... Uh... Yeah, network and Nigeria. Yeah, network and Nigeria. Was <laughs> yeah. Was it's yes, we're online. You can see the screen. Here? Yes, there Here? we are. Yes. Okay. Okay. So like I said, um so to to probe uh, or to understand uh, what responds to what. So there is, should be there is uh the they use calcium imaging. Which is an invisible imaging with their genetically encoded uh, sensor, uh, GCAM6, to record the uh, the activity or, or activation of these um, neurons based on the stimulant from uh, the liquid water, like you know, from the from from whatever stimulant they they, they put. So here, what they did was they put um, fresh water and also. Um, um, salt water in, in, in different concentration. See that uh, what is responding during this uh, activity. So here uh, in, in, in this uh, plot here, what is shown here, this uh, calcium, uh, calcium response is when they just, when they activate with, uh, when they just uh, like, you know, expose the tassie or the legs with water, there is an activity that shows, okay, uh, there is an activity um, that the, the neurons are responding to, to water. But in when they increase, when they put a salt, uh, like you know, kind of mix it with salt. I uh, just want to put it like as really um, naive as possible. To they put uh, salt here, and then there is an increase in in this uh, activity. Um, so that means uh, the activity is kind of doubled um, based on the increase of salt. So to understand why this happened. They knocked down the uh, PPK301 gene, and then there was uh, like you know there was no response uh, here. Like in, so the the graph 
this just this is sh just showing this here is just showing the quantification in, in plots showing that this plot uh, there is no any activity as you can see here and uh, this is from the wild type as you can see that there's a lot of difference between the two but when they increase the salt concentration that this activity increases and it's still there uh, from these uh, neurons, they keep responding. So that means that is um, a different. So here they, they, they concluded that that is um, uh, the receptor that is responsible for sensing water and initiation of egg laying is this PPT301, but other receptors are responsible for detecting water. So that's what some of the guys in the lab are probing at the moment. And what I'm trying to understand for me is what about other constituents? What about other elements within the within the the, the constituent water? So what? Uh, how, how can we uh, look at all this the repertoire? So using this same technique, that's how we are going to look at diff different um, uh, uh, chemicals within those breathing sites that we collected the water from. And the future direction of this is to understand the level, um, receptor level response to these breathing sites constituents. Uh, for example, the elements within there, the pH and other components, and also to quantify any expression or sequence of chemoreceptor gene function cross tissue involved in egg laying in strains with divergent opposition site preference. Because here in this number two, um, uh, if the opposition sites are distinctly different, how does how does the uh, the receptors compensate and just like you know allow them like you know to say okay this is okay and we can adapt to this place and and and, and the, the the changes in in, in, in this uh, response so what is happening within that within that space what happened uh, when you expose these mosquitoes to to new sites uh, are there like you know kind of expression of uh, other receptors within that uh, so that's what we are trying to understand. So thank you very much. I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisor, uh, Ben Matthews, and also my collaborator, Nicolas Tocho, and, uh, and then my collaborators in Gumbi City University, Ezra Abba and Kennedy Yorio, and also the entire uh, Ben Matthews lab members, and also acknowledge my funding bodies, and also specifically from the City University for uh, training me and pushing me out, um, making me a better person. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation and a lot of insights into how mosquitoes are really uh, behaving. It's, it's really an eye-opener. Um, once again, we apologize to those who watching and those who will watch us subsequently for the network, network glitch we, we experienced during in the course of the session. At uh, the moment, I think we'll be open for questions and I will indulge people to drop their questions in the comment section so I will be able to read them out. Uh, there are some few questions asked. I think there is two questions asked by Olua Tosin Ademola. Let me just show it. It kind of didn't resonate that well card with me but I would like the presenter to have a look on them also. So what, I think is he... the, what is the what is AGCG? I think uh, what is AGCG? AGCG is a mosquito. It's a species of mosquito that is uh, responsible for carrying like it's a vector of disease too, like ma, like ma, like um, anopheles and uh, colicine and the rest, and that carries uh, viruses, for specifically like uh, dengue yellow fever and uh, chikungunya viruses. And uh, it is really harmful to mankind. Uh, as you know, like, you know, maybe you know someone that has done yellow fever or um, has this dengue fever. So it was at some point uh, a really uh, health issue and still it's a really health issue. It um, presents uh, the patient with hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic fever and other different types of uh, um, symptoms. Yeah, I hope. And the same person asked another question. I think it's he asks, "What is the what etiology?" etiology. Mm. Agent. So it's just it carries different viruses. This viruses 
leads to different types of uh, these diseases that I mentioned. Um, dengue, yellow fever, um, chikungunya. So uh, the so it, that's the etiology actually. So that's what causes these diseases, the, the virus. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. So personally, I have one of one more of curious question to ask. Uh, in the course of your presentation, you showed um, you feed blood to these mosquitoes. I was wondering, yeah. uh, are those human bloods or is it just animal bloods you use? Oh, these are sheep blood. Oh, they sheep use sterilized. Yeah, sterilized sheep blood. Yeah, actually, when we finish uh, feeding the mosquito, you can just clean them and put them in normal garbage because they are not um, harmful at all. Mm, so they have appetite yeah. for yeah. sheep or something like that? No, not really. So what, what you do uh, do to the uh, mosquitoes, you, you create the context. You create the context for them to feel that, okay, they are going for humans or they are going for an animal. Because uh, what they do is, like I showed you two types of uh, mosquitoes. One is uh, Aedes aegypti aegypti, and then there's Aedes aegypti formosus. One mm -hmm. is more of an uh, animal uh, based, uh, kind of uh, uh, centric, in or is interested in more animals than humans, and some are kind of uh, interested in both. So, mm -hmm. so uh, um, So they to put them into the context, you need to supply them with CO2 because that's what attracts them. Show them that, okay, this is a living being mm. that we can be able to target. And also um, you put humidity, that's a bit of humidity within humans and also increase the temperature to right temperature of an animal, you know? Um, so also um, to for them to, okay, and they have to be uh, when they, gravid or pregnant mm. for them to be attracted to this blood because they want this blood so there is an elevation of uh, interest in them for them to attract to be attracted to this blood for them to have this proteins that they need for developing their egg, egg, eggs within the, the period well that's interesting yeah it's uh, really a work of art so one one more thing i wanted to ask is um when looking into the context of let's say nigeria and we see the amount of uh, deaths resulting from malaria every year which is as a result of mosquitoes bite which is usually the anaphylis um as a specialist in mosquito or kind of you working now in on mosquitoes uh, how do you think we are at the level of research to see to reach a level of eradicating mosquitoes because they usually kind of have about diseases that are harmful harmful to humans so mosquitoes in different senses uh we have over 3500 i think more or more uh, species of mosquitoes and uh, the only ones that are vectors i think are less than uh, 800 or something I can't remember but the uh, so you can't say you want to eradicate the old mosquitoes uh, for me okay. it's not it's not good and uh, because mosquitoes do other jobs, for example, they are involved. They are involved in in uh, what's it called? Um, this moving of uh, from anta to the stigma, the uh, pollination. Yeah. So they yeah. kind of take. Uh, yeah, they, they are involved in pollination because there are some plants or uh, flowers that are really small that only a mosquito can pass through. Not bees, not bigger bumblebees or whatnot. So or so that's. Uh, one of the importance of mosquitoes and for eradication of mosquitoes there needs to be a gene drive kind of uh, um, possibility but for Nigerian context we are not ready mm. for that at the moment because the, um, yes there are a lot of research uh, being done a lot have been uh, spent and a lot of people have been working and uh, but the, the the main idea is how can we uh, clean our environment. Like I showed uh, from mm. Vietco that these mosquitoes thrive in um, in unattended containers of water. So you allow a container to be there for a long time or tires, use tires and whatnot. And at the end of the day, 
if we clean our environment, at least we'll reduce that burden. You know, you allow gutters, mm-hmm. you allow everything, and then you say, okay, I have mosquitoes. Yeah, mosquitoes will try far around, around your area. So that's the, the thing. You have to take responsibility before uh, government, like, you know, take it serious. Mm. Wow. So it's all spin back to the basic thing of just sanitation. Mm. So that is another question from Sam, from um, Tijani Ali Mustafa saying, what is distribution of Aegis Egypt in Africa, specifically in Nigeria? Like I said, uh, it is widely distributed. Uh, there is no state that you go, you cannot find Aegis uh, uh, in Nigeria. Like everywhere, there was a uh, study done by uh, some people in, in University of Kinsuka. And they showed that they did sample from different spaces and they showed that it's there everywhere. Another thing is like I showed you, um, the Nigerian environment is within the sub-Saharan region where um, the Aedes aegypti thrive. You know, they thrive in that area because we have this uh, cyclical rain and also the, the weather is good for, for, for them to thrive, the, the, the temperature and we are not uh, clean. We just throw away uh, plastic bottles and whatnot everywhere. So it is distributed, widely distributed. And we use mm-hmm. old tires, you know. So whenever you mm-hmm. even, like, you know, move tires around, you know, you are transporting the X. That's all that was done, oh. I think, in, in Senegal, where they, they asked people around to just put water into un- unused tires just within three, four days to tell them, to call the researchers what they see in the water. And most people called the researchers and told them that, okay, we have seen that the uh, lab is within those place. Wow. And it's, uh, 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 so you can imagine how... Mm, this is actually an emergency that needs very small intervention to solve. That is a long question from Jamila Umar saying, yeah. We talked about yeah. mosquitoes, yes, using receptors to a certain salt concentration of water before laying their eggs. Is there a salt concentration that is right in terms of percentage? Do all the mosquitoes lay eggs in only those salt water concentration, or do other species lay their eggs in different concentration? That's interesting. So I think we have three questions in there. So the, so the, so the. So like like I said, yeah yeah. So like uh, so I think one question will answer it. So there are, there are um, <laughs> yeah. So there are um, a level um, of uh, uh, salt uh, concentration that is okay for the mosquitoes to lay their eggs. So I didn't show you that is that I was supposed to show you to show that there is a, a level of where the mosquitoes keep laying their eggs until you reach a certain concentration. Which is about 200 milliosmoles more that the um, the egg laying drops down to zero. Mm. So at, at that point, it's tolerable for the mosquitoes to lay their eggs because the the egg uh, concentration is okay. And and there are other types of Aedes aegypti, type of uh, subspecies of uh, Aedes aegypti, uh, Aedes. They can live in a high uh, salt, uh, like a seawater environment, and they can thrive. With the high a situation where they reach that and they drop in, in, in responding or in tolerating the salt concentration. I hope I answered. Yeah, we, we even though the last the last statements you made, I think we we didn't capture that because of network glitch. So I don't know, Jamila Umar, if the question is answered and if you have any concern, please you can post so that we can address it more. Great. Yes. Oh. I think we lost our presenter again, even though we have one more question popping. Uh, okay, this one is just a well wisher from K. Karen saying, I'm so excited about your success and wish you the best. Thank you, Karen. 
So this even brings us to the, okay. Yes, so our presenter is back online. Yes, yeah. nice to have you back, yes. I heard my response to that question. Yes, so we're, I, we're waiting for Jamila Omar, if in case, because the last some last the last statement we made up in the question, we were not able to capture it because of uh, network glitch. So, but if in case she isn't satisfied, we urge her to ask another question so that we can read it out. So that is another question from Al Ali. To join Al Ali Mustafa, if I'm correct, is there? It's very rare to see Egypt in northern Nigeria. Is there any factor responsible for yes. that, please? Yes. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a lot of plastic waste. We have, have a lot of water carrying containers that are all over. We have mm -hmm. on news tires. We have places where people are like, you know, uh, um, not so there are a lot of places where you know when you go there there are uh, and we have open waters in our area mm. in northern Nigeria so it's everywhere we sampled from northern Nigeria we sampled from uh, uh, mostly northeast part of Nigeria and there are a lot of uh, ABC GT. so it's not isolated to anywhere uh, specifically in Nigeria yeah so anywhere you find all these places there is like a invasion of this uh, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So Jamila Omar is saying we did not catch the last part of the response. Okay. For our question. So, yes, let me bring it up again. <laughs> so this so this uh last part of the question, like I said, um the mosquitoes are tolerant to a certain level of salt, and when it reaches that high level, it, it goes down in terms of response, in terms of uh, uh tolerance. So uh, the the number around where like you know the level of tolerance stops is around 200 milliosmol. That's when mm. the 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 level of uh, tolerance where it goes down to to uh, zero or um, that they are okay, okay. This is I I cannot they cannot take it anymore. They can't lay their eggs. It's not okay for them to lay their eggs even if they have to. So they kind of hold the eggs and, and keep moving. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you. Another question from Amira. Are these mosquitoes, specifically edges, Egypti harmful like the normal mosquitoes or are they not? Yeah, they are. They are harmful. They are harmful like the normal mosquitoes. They just don't lay as much eggs as the uh, the their Anopheles. Uh, Anopheles, yes. So they don't, um, but they are harmful. Like yellow mm -hmm. fever, dengue, uh, chikungunya is more deadlier than yes. than uh, malaria. Uh, malaria, but they are all deadly. But malaria is more frequent because it's, it's more widespread. But those ones, when they get to, they are they are more deadly. So, well, we need uh, indeed some active response. So uh, this is just a personal question from me. In the course of your presentation, you talked about how these uh, mosquitoes are really intelligent, and some part of your your work is even trying to capture how they monitor the navigation and kind of partake in some complex um, form of uh, memory and other things. So I know that is a concept of this genetic memory where. It's, it's passed from generation to generation. Is there any evidence showing that these mosquitoes, among, among their, how they, they adapt to this uh, changing world, they have some kind of genetic memory that is passed uh, along the, 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 the progeny? That's what I'm looking at. That's oh. my whole concept of research. I'm trying to understand how these mosquitoes adapt to this environment. How do they adapt? How do they... Um, move around this environment? How do they remember when they touch this space that is not good for them? Or mm -hmm. how do they grade this environment? So grading, understanding, probing, and coming back or going forward uh, requires mm -hmm. a level of intelligence for them to compute that information for them to be able to, to say, okay, this is okay and this is not okay. You know, 
And uh, that's why um, we are still doing the experiment uh, showing that when you expose them to water from four different sites and you put one mosquito, how does the mosquito make that decision? So that decision-making mm -hmm. process, from there, we will look at in high resolution the 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 uh, the idea of we look at the idea of of that to prove that idea of uh, having the uh, the that decision making process like the decision or the intelligence on in, in, in making that decision so that's what we are trying to prove in that particular first experiment that i showed mm -hmm. Yeah, well, thank you very much. It's indeed what we will be all looking forward to see <laughs> because I know it's going to be really interesting. I can see we don't have any more questions from the audience. Um, probably I will add one more question and we are already over time, but because of the network glitch, we added some minutes. And this is kind of more or less of a general um, um, question, Max, in terms of uh, so another one just popped in from Daniel Dauda, Daudu. Sorry if I pronounced. Hi, great presentation. Two questions. How does the analysis of test receptor mutants help in understanding the role of these receptors in driving feeding, biting, or oviposition behavior? To what are the next steps in research and what future direction do you see for this field of study? So test receptor mutants, it's, yes, it's test. Uh, they are using taste in, in general because they probe with their proboscis and that's the mouthpiece. And um, so uh, these sensory receptors, like, they project to the test centers. And uh, so if you look at it in, in, in different, in this context is, since the water has different constituents and there are so many like a cocktail of different things inside, so what if, like, you know, you, you, you silence a particular receptor gradedly of these um, uh, receptors and see the response over time and, and see that, okay, this is responsible for that, but this allows for egg laying. Okay, this, when you, probe, when you like, you know, mute, uh, mutate this, it's not going to be, um, it's not going to allow egg laying. You know, that kind of thing. So we do it um, uh, one by one. So, for example, like I showed you the work done by Matthew L. et al., shows that they only looked at one receptor, one gene, PPK301, and it was responsible for detecting water, but it's not responsible for detecting salt because when it was mutated, the neuron keep responding to salt. So in that sense, we have to look for uh, the receptor that is detecting salt. So in that receptor that is detecting salt, there is a PhD student working on that at the moment. He's almost done uh, trying to well, allow at uh, some point to uh, present uh, in that sense to see, like, you know, so that people can have a feel of that. Another person is looking at the test particularly. Uh, some other one is looking at specifically um, uh, texture to see that this piece is okay for, it's not smooth, but it's a bit groovy. So that I can be able to put my X and this X will like, you know, uh, cling on to this substrate. So they analyze things as small or as minute as the has how it, and for the future direction of this research, that's what I just said, actually. So it's <laughs> to understand in different contexts, different receptors of different constituents of this water. Um, so that we can be able to know what and when to pause during gene drive to target um, in, in eradication or like, you know, in um, changing the behavior of these mosquitoes so that they can actually not bite humans, but you can just go and do pollination so that we can have more food. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Yunus. I think we are really over time and it's time we bring this session to a close. In case you have any question or you are working on mosquitoes or willing to work on mosquitoes or anything among the field of research of Dr. Yunus, you can find him on Google. Just search his name and his details and contact details will appear. You can reach to him for mentorship, for advice. 
And in case you need anything that has to do with your work in BioRTC, we are open. And the main purpose of the existence of BioRTC is to create the environment in which we will host scientists, provide them with all the necessary state-of-art equipment that will make their research easier. So that is the sole purpose. Reach out for mentorship, reach out for advice, reach out for visitation. Follow us on social media, on our social media handles. We are available on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube at BioRTC NIG. Bio, B I O R T C N I G. So, thank you very much once again. Thank you uh, very much, the presenter, Dr. Inusa Muhammad, for joining us today, and all the audience that create time to listen to us. Look forward to the next episode of our activity, which will be another um, webinar next month. And we'll be having, and I would like to use this moment to regarding the that the, our summer school that is coming up in August. We have a lot of applicants, a lot of good applications. Congratulations to those that were able to get selected. And for those that didn't get it, it is, that is, BioTC is not meant for only summer school. It is meant, the summer school is just meant for eye opener. So that people will come and see what is in there and what things can be done. But most importantly is the visitation. You can reach out to the BioTC. You can check our website on www.biotc.com. See what we are doing, see what we have. Send us email and we are open for you to come for visitation to do your uh, research work while we provide you with mentorship and a lot more. So thank you very much. With this, we bring to the end of our broadcast today and I wish everyone a uh, good evening. All right.